Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to my recap and review of Outlander Season 6 Episode 1 Echoes. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining. If you are coming back and have been long awaiting this recap as I have for the last two years, welcome again my friends and I am so excited to officially be starting my season six content for Outlander. Um, we get to ease back into it this year with there being eight episodes and I am thrilled. I'm so excited. It has been a long time coming and I'm so excited. I'm also a little nervous because it's been quite a while since I've done a breakdown of a TV show based on a book that I love. The last time I was doing this was for Bridgerton, which I will be doing this for Bridgerton as well, which will make things interesting since those overlap with each other this year. But to just do a reminder, a refresher, in case you haven't seen my breakdowns of previous seasons, I'll tell you what you can expect from me because it's going to be a little bit different than if you're going to a uh, channel who specifically is focused towards just film and TV um, because I'm definitely going to review things a little bit differently and this is going to be more of a discussion, a compare and contrast, things like that. This is going to be heavily based on my opinion uh, because that's what I do. Um, if you're finding me and you don't know what this channel is about, I review romance books. That is what my channel is all about. It has been for the last like three years. And for me, even though the Outlander books, this is really shiny, so it's going to sparkle, even though the Outlander books are technically considered historical fiction or maybe like, you know, fantasy, whatever. To me, the romance and the relationships in the series are what have drawn me to it and kept me interested for all these years. And that is what I focus on when I break things down. So again, it's been a while. I have my brandy here with me, you know, for a little bit of libation. It's only 11 a.m. on Sunday, so I'm not going to go too hard with this. I have my Sassanac mug with water because I know I will be talking a lot. And I have my... Um, three and a half pages of notes. <laughs> and yeah, so basically, I hope I've explained it. This is going to be a recap of the episodes from a book lover's perspective. Now, obviously, I don't know these books backwards and forwards because there is an aggressive amount of content that Diana Gabaldon has blessed us with, but I'm going to be going off of my recollection. And the things that I don't remember or I say wrong, please feel free to comment down below if you know better. Um, but this is to kind of give us a place to have a discussion as book lovers because one of the things that first made me want to break down Outlander, and if you were around two years ago when I did this, you'll have heard this then, is that whenever I would see um, show watchers break down the show, they were like, well, we can't talk about the books because this is something that's separate. And while that is true, I also think that it's dishonest and it's a way to get out of it. Like everything that Outlander, the TV show has, it has because these books existed first and it had such a big fan base built in and that's why it got made in the first place. So I get very frustrated as a book lover when the show comes out and everyone wants to be like, well, you can't compare it to the books or there's people who've never even read the books. You're right. And then you can go and watch the content done by those creators who are just reviewing it based on the show. There are some who do an amazing job who are just talking about the show of quality. And I'll say this, and then we're going to get into it. I promise we're going to get into this. Um, I absolutely love the production, the directors, the actors, the create every from the costumes to the script to everything that is put into this. And this is something that I really tried to hammer home last year or two years ago, because there were some episodes in season five that really pissed me off as a book lover. When I get angry or excited about things, which probably will happen during this season at some point, I'm never dissing the people who make it, you know, like I, the actual product coming out. I will be frustrated with the writers about choices they make or things we have to do because let's say the main actress is having a baby and we have to cut things short. Like that is not any like, how dare they mess this up. But as a book lover who wants to maybe show you how things could have been or talk through things, I'm allowed to be frustrated and upset. And it doesn't mean that I want to burn it all down. Okay. Okay, are we there? I feel like it's been a couple years and a while since we've done this, so it's good to set that groundwork. 
So now that we're already five minutes in, let's dive in to echoes, okay? And again, forgive me, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so my plan is to just kind of go through the episode talk about the scenes that we saw, say if I think they're pretty book accurate or comment a little on where I think the story is going. Um, I'm going to try not to straight up spoil everything that's happening just in case like I know I said this is for book watchers but there are some people who watch my videos who just want to know how well the episode compares to the book without knowing ahead of it um, and so I may hint at some things coming in the future but I will mostly try to keep it focused to this. So we start this season with an extended front heavy piece of the episode that is focused on Ardsmere prison. So we flash back to the time when Jamie had only recently been taken to Ardsmere. He's not considered the like top man at the prison yet. Um, and we get introduced to Tom Christie, who I'm very interested to see people who haven't read the books, you know, what their take is going to be on the Christie's. I'm very interested to see what everyone's speculation will be about that because I have very interesting feelings about the Christie family, specifically, specifically Tom Christie. And I was very intrigued with how they started him out in this. Um, I already seen a couple comments where people were like, this is so boring for this huge first chunk to be at Ardsmere. And there were some people saying we could have done flashbacks in between. I definitely see that argument. And I will say that I was like, oh, wow, we're spending a lot of time with this, you know, in the past part of it. But I actually think it was very smart because it sets up this very interesting baseline for when Jamie first meets Tom, it sets up the conflicts between them and it sets up the things that are similar about them. You know, Tom Christie, I think, also is a leader of men in a certain aspect, but the way that he leads men, or at least the way the show is showing it, because I'll talk, obviously I'll talk about how I think his uh, portrayal, how it compares and contrasts with the book. But for the show purposes, I think it really shows like, the difference in how Tom Christie is a leader of men. He uses fear and he uses, you know, I mean, he is trying to rally people around, you know, his religion and about um, Protestant and, you know, trying to rally people around, we're not living for this world, we're living for the next one. Whereas we have Jamie at the other side of the coin where the way that he leads men and why every room that he's in, he becomes the king of men. I wrote in my notes when he's taking that whipping um, for the bit of tartan that gets found, I said, wherever he is, Jamie becomes a king of men, even when he wants to just be left alone, when he wants peace, because he's just trying to live out his time till he gets till he can be with Claire again, because he doesn't believe in suicide. He doesn't believe in, in ending it for himself, but he's basically just trying to live out time until he gets to heaven or purgatory to wait for Claire. Um, and he, we even see a bit of that when he's talking to that man who is blind and is looking for the piece of hair and, you know, wishing to be with his loved one. And Jamie tells him, he's like, we've known something that men, most men never get to know. And even though we've lost it now, like in this world, we haven't lost it forever. And that's why we have to keep going because if we want the chance of eternity with our loved one, we have to keep pushing through. And anyway, sidetracked by Jamie there. So I think we really see the, the contrasting sides of like, we have Tom and Jamie, they're both leaders, but they lead in very different ways. You know, Tom is very like, we lead by the law of God and he's the one who, you know, I'm rallying people behind that. And Jamie is more, I mean, Jamie definitely believes in God. He has a very high faith, but he's also is God helps those who help himself. And he is self-sacrificing, but he always, but he also just has this kind of dignity that draws people into him. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, I also, what else did I comment on during this part? Um, I actually had to like look this part up. So I definitely did. Um, I'm going to rely a little more on Google this time around because I haven't just done my reread of this book. Whereas two years ago, I had just finished my reread of like the fiery cross, um, <clears throat> when I was filming those reviews. So I did Google to make sure that this part of Ardsmuir was very truthful. And man, it really was the story that, um, and I believe it's Jamie tells it to Claire. 
is what happens in the book when we meet Tom. And I think it happens at the end of the fiery cross. I could be wrong about that. But I mean, I do know that we meet uh, Tom at the end of the fiery cross because when Jamie is injured, that's when Roger meets Tom and he's like, oh, you're from Ardsmere. We're inviting you in. Great. And, and Jamie's like, he's literally the only person from Ardsmere I wish had not shown up, you know? Um, and I was, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I'm sorry. That's just going to happen with me. I was very happy to see that Roger still got to be the one to kind of like welcome him in, even though he's like, Ooh, what did I do? Did I just make things awkward for Jamie by having this guy here? Because that was something that I really harped on in season five is that every important thing that Roger had done was either given to another character or like, you know, he didn't get to do it. So even though Jamie wasn't on death's door when this happened, Roger still got to be the one to invite him in and to extend that hospitality, maybe hospitality that Jamie didn't want to extend, but he gets to extend that hospitality and kind of show that he is a trusted person by his father-in-law. Um, and I really appreciate that because I want Roger's character to get to be built up a bit more. We all know how I feel about that. So anyway, wrapping up this stuff that happened in Ardsmere, another part that's important to share is that Jamie speaks with the governor. This is the governor that we saw in season four handing off Ardsmere, or season three, I'm sorry, season three, handing Ardsmere over to Lord John. Um, and he, at that time, Jamie was kind of the head of the prisoners. And that's the one that, that's why John and Jamie have to meet when John comes to the prison, right? So that all, you know, we're seeing what happened beforehand with that. And anyways, so Jamie gets inducted into the stonemasons and then they don't really explain. I'm sure it will get touched on later, but, um, or Freemasons and Jamie gets inducted and he becomes an apprentice. And over his time at Ardsmere, he makes it to a master status because he tells him, he's like, we may not, we are going to be on divided lines by the Scottish Protestants and the Scottish Catholics. But if you give us something else we can unite under, it will be a way to smooth over the tensions because Jamie understands men. He knows that they have enough other issues besides fighting each other. And if they can give them something to focus on where they get to be teammates, where they get to support each other, he'll have peace at Ardsmere where they can just live out their sentence. So that is a big chunk of it. And so this episode was 81 minutes, I think is how long it was. And I do think that was a good choice because that made it so that we were able to have this pretty extended prologue that I know some people said was boring. I get it, but it is very important to set up the dynamic between Tom and Jamie. And I think we see a very different Tom Christie at the prison. He's a lot more full of piss and vinegar. He's a lot more antagonistic to Jamie and trying to undercut him. And when we get to see him after the intro, which I want to talk about in just a second, we get to talk to him after the intro, you really do see a more humble man. And I think as we slowly will pull out what's happened to Tom in the time between Ardsmere and now and the things he's been through, I think we're going to be unraveling you know, what has made him more humble, what has made him a little more reserved, even though we'll see that poking out. So the new intro. Now, I know most people have probably like heard this already because I know it was released, but I have learned in the past few years that I really love to hear the new intro for the first time when I'm watching the episode because I want to see all those little hints at future scenes and, and hear it in the context of like, what's the mood of the season. So this year it helped that I was been, I've been very busy. So this was the first time I've listened to the new intro and it starts with a man as the first one singing and he's singing, sing me a song of a lad that is gone. And it's a very rough and um, almost like not perfectly in tune version, um, which I think is very interesting. I was getting these vibes of, of, of like a little bit of disorder happening, which was just really cool, but it ends up being a duet. There's a man and a woman singing together, um, not an overly aggressive, like music accompanying them. And then the scenes we got to see, which, um, 
I didn't like pick at them all, but I recently put out a video, which if you would like to watch it now that you've seen this and you're waiting for the next episode to come out, I did six scenes that I wanted to see in season six. I know, try saying that six times fast. And I feel like from this, um, this in the, the intro song that I saw clips from like almost all of those scenes that I mentioned. So I'm very excited about that because these scenes that I want to see were like all in this intro, which made me really happy. And on another note with that, in this episode itself, I feel like all the conflicts that I mentioned in that video are kind of all set up in this episode. I was very impressed. It was a very long episode and it really had a lot of the issues all popping up. So, okay. So we get back from the intro. I need another sip here. And we have a couple things going on. So we have Chrissy showing up. He's making his way to Fraser's Ridge. We have Claire who has figured out how to make ether. I'm so glad we had that. We had penicillin we were figuring out last season. We have ether that we were figuring out this season. Um, she's going to be able to do surgeries or fix things with people um, not having to be awake, which is great. Ether is a super dangerous thing to make, but it is going to be very helpful. And I'm a little bit like torn. I wonder if I have it. Do I have it on this page or is it later? Hold on. Okay, no, we'll talk about it now then because I don't think I have it in notes for later. Um, we have Brie and, um, and Claire talking. That might be later. Nope, we're going to keep going. Sorry, I know I've done this twice. Okay, so the only part of this episode that was really kind of like awkward for me, and I felt that way in previous seasons, but it was Brie and Claire talking together and talking about, you know, Brie wants to know what kind of uh, inventions Brie is working on, you know, because she had been, uh, she's an engineer, is what she went to school for. And Claire's like, well, what are you working on? You know, there, there could be really cool projects you, you do. And Brie is nervous because of what happened with Claire. She's nervous about being seen as like witchcraft or these things. And Claire, she makes a good point, but it's also still like, I don't know what it is about these kind of conversations that are so cringe for me. I don't know what it is of just how they acted out is a little awkward for me, but Brie is like, yeah, mom, like, I don't want anything bad to happen. And Claire's like, you're, we're doing things to help people. And if they see us as being strange, like that's their problem, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, and I really, I really like that sentiment. But again, this, this is a note for me where I didn't like this when it happened last season. I don't like it now. I don't like us showing Brie as being so timid. It's something that's always bothered me. Brianna is like rushing headlong ahead. You know, she, they mentioned the phosphorus from Lord John, which is great. That's something that Brie uses to make matches. Um, she starts working, you know, in the book, she's figuring out how to make like piping so that they can have plumbing that's better. She's working on being able to make a a kiln so that they can make like bricks. Like there's all these things she's working on. I um, mean, right now they just, there wasn't really anything significant that they showed Brie doing in this episode yet at all. And I kind of feel like everybody else, we kind of had what their character for the season was going to be. So hopefully in the next episode, we get to see Brie kind of deciding what her passion is going to be and what she's going to be working towards because she's really kind of the only one who is just there in some scenes. And that was awkward for me. So then we have, um, is, I think it's McDonald is a Colonel McDonald. I don't know, but, it, and he's asking Jamie to be the Indian agent for the crown. So we're still on the British loyalties for a certain part. And Jamie is like, I don't want to be involved in anything else. I've given all that I can to this. Like, I just want to be in peace. And McDonald is like, well, if you don't do it, someone else is going to. And Jamie's like, no. And he's like, well, I'll stop again on my way back in case you change your mind. You know, this governor, he might decide to call in all your taxes if you won't do this for him. And Jamie's like, we'll pay our fair share. But I have people here. We have new people starting. We have homes to build. We have stuff that we're doing here. And McDonald doesn't really give him too hard of a time this time. He's like, I'll be back later. So we also have a little hint that um, Marcely is pregnant with their fourth baby. I miss it in season five. I thought this, they had had this as the third 
And I think that they just like, were like, we'll just pop in another kid. She was probably pregnant at some point. Um, and this is supposed to be the fourth and she's very pregnant. We see bruises on her hand. We have hints that Fergus is staying away from home. He's feeling very useless. And I think we're supposed to connect it with, um, you know, what had happened to her at the still. Um, and so he's feeling very guilty that he was very ineffectual. Um, I don't totally think they've laid the groundwork for Fergus being like this enough yet, but there was a lot of things that went wrong in season five and I'm okay with us kind of just forget what you saw before. We're going to start Fergus right here. This is a sentiment that we've seen before, you know, where he wasn't able to help in certain things. You know, he feels useless with just his one hand. Um, so I'm okay with us starting it at this point in this book because it is a very important character arc for Fergus and Marsley what's happening. So sh we can tell that Claire's noticing that um, there's a bruise on her wrist. It looks like she was gripped too tight. Um, and I think it's a very interesting line to walk because we don't want to completely make Fergus out to be a villain or that he is completely unredeemable because that's not where Diana takes his character. That's not where we're fully going, but there will be some, well, I hope so. In the book, there are some very interesting discussions about Fergus's mental health that we get into in a uh, Breath of Snow and Ashes. And so I hope that that's where we're going with this because it is a very important conversation to have. And I think they're doing a great job kind of setting that up without having him have done anything yet that is completely irredeemable. He's been stumbling around drunk a bit. He has been embarrassing to Marsley. He has gripped her wrist too tight, but we haven't seen anything so, you know, because Mars Marsley has said in previous seasons to Brie, like she remembers seeing her mother be abused and she won't put up with it. And Marsley is a very strong woman and she loves her husband, but she won't be mistreated. So, I think it's a hard line to walk because no domestic abuse is acceptable, but there is a difference between someone who needs an intervention and doesn't fully realize the damage they're doing to the people around them and someone who is needlessly cruel and is just a horrible person. And when I read the books, I really appreciated how Diana, she had Fergus right on the line of going too far. But what ultimately happens with that relationship or with their relationship and with their family, I'm very satisfied with. And so I'm excited to see how this plays out anyway. So, all right. So we have a scene with Tom and Roger now. Um, he's going to be taken on. Um, he seems a bit more humble to me. I would like to, again, I would like to hear people's opinions. I think it's very interesting because there's a few layers to this, like so many layers to this. I feel like he very much does not want to be in Jamie Fraser's debt. He doesn't want to have to come here, what he feels like begging for a place to stay, but he's doing it in the name of these fisher folk that he's with, with his son and daughter. He, you know, wants them to have a place to settle. And so you can see this warring between him where he's thankful for it, but he also doesn't want to owe Jamie anything and so there's this weird like you know you have these two very conflicting personalities who they you know Jamie doesn't need Christy to be there like there's nothing he's really offering at this point that makes him invaluable to Jamie but Christy needs him so it's a very I'm very interested to see how that's going to unfold but this reaction where Tom was there and Jamie and Roger and all this, I thought it was very interesting because Christy will let, like say one thing and I'll really like him. And then he says the next thing and we're like, why is he poking at Jamie? And it just kind of goes like back and forth between this. And I think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting dynamic. And I like the little bit of like perk up that we see in Roger um, because we haven't really completely spoken about where Roger is going to be going yet in this season. But you know, if you watch, you know, in that intro, we do see Roger praying with the Bible in a new building. Um, so I think we're definitely going towards that. Um, but, 
you know, Tom makes it known that he's a Protestant, that he um, isn't Catholic, and the people that he brought with him aren't. And Roger's kind of like, oh, my father was a Presbyterian minister. Interesting. And that's like all we really see with it for now, but the seed is definitely there. And I'm excited to see how that grows, particularly for Roger, because this is a career path for him that I wish had been brought up a while ago, but you know, I'm happy it's happening. And then we end up going to see the people and we meet Alan and Malva. I have some interesting things to say about them later on. Um, again, those of you who are book lovers, I would just like what your first impressions of them are in this episode. Let's not spoil anything that's coming ahead, like I said, but we can definitely talk about what we think of first impressions of these people um, because we'll get more into them. So then we go to Jamie and Claire and we have our first sex scene of the season, which we know that, uh, not that the sex scenes have been overabundant in previous seasons. Like I, I'm glad that they still show up, but I definitely think the show has curtailed them quite a bit. And specifically in this season, we know that Katrina Bell it was pregnant for this season. Um, and so we have a sex scene in bed where you know, we're only getting waist up. Um, I could definitely tell, um, by, uh, her lady bits that I was like, definitely, definitely. I mean, if you've seen her in previous seasons, that's all that I'm saying. If you've seen Cat naked <laughs> in previous seasons, you know the woman does not have breasts that far. <laughs> which, which in the show, this could be played off as age as well. You know, things start to a little bit. Anyway, I won't focus on it. The point being, it was a very beautiful scene. Um, we don't need a full length, full naked sex scenes anyway. It's about the intimacy between these two and Jamie saying that like, you know, Tom found out his wife had left him during this, during when he was in Ardsmere. But for me, you were always there with me. You were my angel. You helped me make it through. And it's just so beautiful. We did see that in the, in the flashback scene where he's imagining her while he's taking that whipping and then they make love and it's absolutely beautiful. Then the next day we have Malva coming to meet Claire. Um, and she is, there's an interesting conversation about phosphorus and Lucifer and she's very, she has a lot of questions for Claire and Claire is kind of like, I don't want to give too much weight to this woman. So we'll see if that apprenticeship ever, you know, brings itself forth because you know in season five we had Marsley kind of becoming that role for her but I don't know now if since she's having another baby and the stuff with Fergus if this is the opportunity to now have Malva step into that apprenticeship role we'll see what happens with it. Malva is the character she's a lot more like timid than I guess I was expecting for the character and we'll see if that you know kind of shakes out with what her character arc is. Sorry, trying to keep things inside where things are going. We'll see. Um, then when we go back to help start building, um, we have a few things happen. We meet widow Amy McCallum. If you've read book nine, you know things about Amy, but I love that she exists. She has a son, Aiden, and then a new baby, and she recently lost her husband, and she came with the Fisher Folk with um, Tom Christie, and um, yeah, so we meet her, and I'll talk about more about her in a minute, and then we see Fergus drunk. He's kind of embarrassing her. We see the Browns causing trouble for Ian and Alan. Alan seeming a little bit sh shady. We get to see this, this powder horn that he says he like made himself. Very interesting. And we meet the Committee of Safety, who is going to be bad news bears, everybody. Bad, bad news bears. Very shady. Then we have one of the scenes that was in my top scenes, and that is Tom's hand. I'm so excited about this. I'm so interested for the interactions between Tom and Claire. I'm not saying like their favorite scenes in the books for me, but I find them so interesting um, because of the banter that happens between them. And this scene where he comes in, he had hurt his hand. He has a bad cut. And he faints at the sight of blood and he like faints on Claire. And so Jamie comes in and helps. And then Jamie stays in there and they're like poking at each other. And um, 
they're bantering back and forth and they both get in some good digs at each other. Claire says, well, the reason it slipped is you have a problem with your hand and I could do surgery on it and I could fix this and then y your hands will be okay. And he's very like, no, I don't want any of that. And she's like, you're not going to be able to use this hand in six months if you don't let me fix it. And he's like, rah, rah, rah. and so he leaves and Claire is like, did you really need to stand over his shoulder? And she's like, yeah, because he wasn't going to whine or faint again if I was standing there. He would rather have hot needles poked into his eyeballs than seem weak in front of me. And Claire has the great line. It's like, you're two wild rams butting heads with each other. And that is a great description for them. But yeah, yeah, I very much enjoy it. Then we see Lizzie and Josiah flirting. Lizzie is very much flirting with Josiah. She mentions, where is Kezi? And he's like, why? So we're definitely seeing some of that situation percolate. I wonder what's going to happen with Lizzie and the twins. I wonder. Wonder what's going on with that. Interesting. Um, then we have um, widow, the widow Amy, and she's having some problems with Aiden. Aiden is feeling very frustrated and is causing problems and Amy is just like please don't get us kicked out of here like you know just calm down and so I really like this little moment because Brie is like do you have an idea like what could we do for them I want to help them but you know we don't want them to feel bad and Roger's like I have an idea is it okay and I love that they have the little check-in moment because there will probably be some drama about Roger and Amy at some point I'm just putting that out there there's never really a problem about Brie and Roger about this. In the books, there's conversations, but not problems. So we'll see what the show does with it. But I like that they show this little check-in where he is like, is it okay if I do something? And she's like, yeah, please. So he goes and talks to Aiden and he's like, listen, Aiden, you're the man of the house. You're the man of your house now. You know, and what we really want to do is we want to build you a cabin. And you, do you want to help us with that? Do you want to help take care of your mom and younger sibling that way? And um, Amy's like, you're building us a cabin? Like that, we couldn't have expected that. And he's like, I know, but that's what we do here. Like it's a community. They're going to build them a cabin. And I'm really happy about it. I'm really happy to see how it goes. Cause I know that there is some like unnecessary drama within that. But for me, what's more important is that Aiden is getting a good role model in Roger and that this community, they're here to help each other. Like that's why we're better together than trying to make it on our own. And I love that. Then we have the Browns coming into town um, and the Committee of Safety and Alan gets accused of stealing the powder horn. And so this puts everybody in an awkward position because Tom Christie, he seems pretty upset with his son as he should. He's like, did you take this? Why would you do this? Like, what are you doing? So it's embarrassing Tom in front of Jamie. And Jamie's embarrassed because Brown has showed up and is trying to cause problems and interfere with his community. Jamie has to be seen as the top dog because this is his Frager's Ridge. And he's the man in charge. It's under his name. And so he has to beat Alan. He, he beats him with his shirt on. He beats him with a belt for this thievery, which... Alan gets off easy. I wrote in my notes, I wish they would have let them have him. <laughs> I don't have any love for Alan Christie. He's a slimy weasel in my opinion, and I will have more things to say about him as we continue. But it is another instance of headbutting. And when they're leaving, it's very interesting because I could tell Tom is very prideful about it. And he's like, you know, and Jamie's kind of like, well, what did you expect? You know, like your son did this. It was either me or it was going to be Brown and it was going to be bad. And I had to do it, but it, it butts them up against each other even more. But it's like someone was going to have to do it. And you're lucky they didn't take his fucking hand. So just calm down. But Jamie is like, you're welcome to be here. But in Ardsmere, we were just getting by here. We're meant to thrive. This is a community. And my word is law on my ridge. And Tom is like, well, God's word is law. And it's like, Jamie's kind of like, I mean, yes, but also we are humans who we have God's law. If you believe in God and you want to follow it, fine. But you do still have to follow what the laws of the world are too. That's, that's the thing. There are things that are illegal to do. Um, so there's an interesting uh, back and forth between them. So then uh, the, what's his face? 
McDonald is there again and Jamie says, I will be your Indian agent. If it's a choice between me or Brown, I will do it. Tell them that I said yes. And this is from the book for sure, where Jamie really just wants to stay home and be home and support his community and be the, be the lair and be the chief here. And he keeps getting sucked in because when you are the king of men, you either have to be the king or people want to own the king so they can own your power and influence that you have. So we'll see where that goes. Um, then we have Fergus still showing a lot of issues. Um, and then the final kind of scene of this episode, which was very ominous, and I'm interested to see what this means for the season. We have this voiceover with Claire and Claire has a nightmare after seeing the Browns again. And she really has a lot of things pulled into this nightmare. Like we hear Black Jack's voice and we hear like Stephen, I think we heard Stephen Bonnet's voice too. And there's the Browns and like all these voices. And so she has a nightmare and Jamie's like, do you need me? And instead of letting him comfort her, she's like, I just need some tea. And when she goes downstairs, she doesn't make herself some tea. She uses the ether to put herself to sleep so that she can sleep. And there's a very dramatic music being played. And there's this quote that she does. Um, and the first part of it, I think, is step by step, we make our ghosts, we haunt ourselves. Um, which I was like, ooh, that sounds like a very, that sounds like a passage at the beginning or the end of one of her books. But um, that quote is actually from Drums of Autumn. I looked it up to check. Um, but I did think it fit very well with the scene we were in because all these different situations she's thinking about, it's like, we make our ghosts, we haunt ourselves. But I am pretty interested with the fact that she used ether to put herself to sleep and I don't know where we're going with that. That doesn't seem to be book accurate to me that she would do that. Um, Jamie and Claire very much let each other support them when they're going through those kind of emotional things. Um, Jamie has nightmares through his whole life of different things. Sometimes it's Ardsmere, sometimes it's Blackjack, sometimes it's just being alone without Claire. So, okay. So yeah, that is kind of a walkthrough of the episode, which always makes me laugh because it takes me as long to explain it as it actually does to watch it. So how was I feeling about it? What is my like overall vibe. So I really enjoyed this episode. I think it, as I said in the beginning, is a very good start to me. I I understand for others where they might be like, oh, this was boring or this, or whatever. I think this one is an amazing setup. As I said, I think all the main plots for the whole season are started here, which of course they are. I mean, that's how a TV show is going to do it but they were all plot lines that are important to the books. Maybe not all this book, but as I have said, I'm okay with a season not following a book. I just don't like when they say this season follows this book and then doesn't. I wish they would just say like, we're just continuing the story and we're going to get as far into it as we can and then keep going. You know, each season does not need to try to match it. There's no way in eight episodes you're going to do this. And they've already taken plot lines from here and put them somewhere else and all those things. I don't need that to happen. I just want the characters that they create and the stories that the situations they're putting them in to be as close to the book as possible, no matter where they're taking it from that. So in regards to that, I feel like this is highly book accurate in what's happening within this story. I think pretty much all of the plot lines they've laid out our book accurate to me. The, like I said, the only one that I'm a bit confused on is Claire like using ether on herself. I'm like, okay, what are we doing? But the plot lines with um, Jamie and Christy, the plot line with, you know, Claire's PTSD part of it, the Indian agents, Alan being shady AF, Malva being interested in healing, Marsley and Fergus dealing with that, um, Roger and you know, what his career path might be. I'm very interested in all of this. And oh yeah, Lizzie and the Beardsleys. So I was very pleased. I was very pleased. Um, I've definitely been pleased for uh, premieres before and had it go downhill. 
Um, I'm interested what this arc is going to be in only eight episodes. Um, but again, there are some very major, major plot points in this book that they've already done. Um, the, the wrapping up of Stephen Bonnet's plot, plot line, um, Claire being raped, um, all of that stuff happens in this book and it was in five. Um, and I don't know if we're going to be seeing more plot from five. I don't think so. Um, just because now that the Christie's are fully a part of it, and like Roger's plot line with the with what he's got and like all of that is all season or book six type of stuff so I'm feeling pretty good about it but so yeah I would say this one pleased me a lot I don't have like really things to critique with this one I really enjoyed myself I think that for book accuracy it was good um, I don't really rate these because it's too difficult I know again like that's something that a lot of um, non book comparing channels will do is they'll like rate it but I think it was a very intriguing start and I'm super excited for everything that I'm seeing so yeah so let me know down below let me know what your favorite scenes are tell me you know if there was anything that I missed things you're not seeing be accurate things you want to see again if you have um read this whole book try not to spoil much further than we've been or else make sure you put spoiler warnings I definitely want to have the conversations about the book compared to the show but let's compare what we saw on the show to the point where we're at in the book and not jump too far ahead um, just so that people going through for the first time can see that so thank you so much for watching this I just want to do a little bit of plug for myself because you know I got to do it make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell um, these are going to be premiering I'm going to premiere these episodes as you probably know if you're watching right, right now at 7 p.m central on Mondays but my channel members um which starting at the dedicated diva level, if you check out channel memberships, they will get these videos starting on Sunday afternoon. So they'll get it a full day and a half before everyone else. So if you want first access to these, maybe check out channel memberships, but otherwise I cannot wait to go through this season with you guys. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.